All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last talk of our seminar series on optimization, algebra, and geometry. Today, we are pleased to have Professor Gabor Pataki from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Gabor will talk about the exponential size of solution in semi-definite program. OK, so thank you for the invitation, Ali. Um, I mean, some of you may have seen this talk, but I hope it's still going to be interesting. It's a joint work with um, a student of mine, Alex Tuzov, who just recently graduated. Um, so I'm going to start with the very basics, which is um, okay, what is semi-definite programming? I mean, we have a bunch of AI matrices, a B symmetric matrix, and we are looking for a, a X1 through XM so that this linear matrix inequality is satisfied. Uh, and the curly inequality, as usual, it means that um, the matrix is positive semi-definite and everything is symmetric here. It's a generalization of linear programming. I mean, we know that this is a very exciting subject. Um, and um, there is one important terminology that I want to introduce, which is the size of a number. Uh, it's essentially the number of bits necessary to describe it, to describe that number. And it's essentially the logarithm of the absolute value of that number. So for example, for, a, for an integer, so if I have a P integer, then this is the size. and we are essentially talking about the logarithm um, in base two of the absolute value. And there's a plus one here or there, but that doesn't really matter so much. And I could define the size of a vector or matrix, but that just follows very naturally. And this is sufficient for, for what we want to do. So, um, so let's jump into the um, motivation of this uh, talk. It's, it's this very, very famous example of Hajian that has exponential size solutions. So the way this looks is this. Um, I have m variables, and the first m minus 1 constraint basically just keeps squaring these variables. And then the last constraint says that xm is greater or equal than 2. Right. So, so a bunch of constraints just square the variables, and the last one says that the xm is at least 2. Now, if I do a little algebra, then it's kind of easy to see that for any x which is feasible, the x1 has to be at least 2 to the 2 to the m minus 1. So not, not, not 2 to the m minus 1, but 2 to the 2 to the m minus 1, which is the, which is the trouble. Uh, and therefore, the size of x is at least the log of the 2 to the 2 to the m minus 1, which is 2 to the m minus 1. OK, so, um, so, so the issue is that um, for any feasible solution, the the size is, has to be huge, and you know we can we can um, do a play around with this and say that well, if m is equal to twenty, then the two to the two to the m minus one is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe and things like that. So, um, and this is an SDP because I can model the quadratic inequalities as linear matrix inequalities, and I can draw a picture. Uh, here I can see that the x three, which is, which goes from grows from uh, right to left to make things better visible um, grows very drastically when the x1 is growing okay so so this is the setup and i should just stop here for a second to make sure that uh, if there's any question no so why is um okay so so let's clarify something so sometimes people ask me so are you looking at sdps in which that exists an exponential size solution? And the answer is no, because that's really not such a big deal. Uh, exponential size solutions exist anytime that the feasible set is unbounded. And that's true even in linear programming, because I can just go in the recession direction and just generate humongous size solutions, which are even bigger size than exponential. So the point is that all solutions have to have exponential size. And the key point is that, the, that we have this hierarchy among the variables. Okay, so um, now why is this interesting? The reason is that we are uh, worried about this problem. Is SDP feasibility in P? So in other words, can I decide whether um, linear matrix inequality is feasible or not in polynomial time? That's a big open question. It's open even for convex quadratic constraints. And the, the, the trouble is that it may be that the only uh, feasible solutions have exponential size. So how do I prove to you that, that um, 
the problem is feasible, I would have to produce this solution, which, however, cannot be produced in polynomial time, because even writing down would take exponential space. So that looks like um, it's kind of hopeless. So this is a major obstacle uh, to, to solving this big open problem. So the question, there are two questions that come up. Um, so is this, are these uh, SDPs, which have these large solutions common? So do they occur a lot? And then the uh, first answer that we, that we give, kind of a knee-jerk answer that we rarely see these. And actually, the only example that we know of is, is exactly this Hachian example. Um, but not only that, but even if I take this Hachian example, uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, so this is the Hachian example where we keep squaring the variables and then we say that uh, the XM is greater equal than two. So these large solutions are very easy to destroy. So for example, one trivial perturbation that I can make, I replace this XM greater equal than two by XM greater equal than two plus XM plus one, where this XM plus one is some kind of new variable. So I just invent a new variable, I stick it at the end and, and as soon as I do that, the XM can be any number because the XM plus one is not constrained. Now, the other thing that I can do is I can just uh, replace X by GX, where G is some random invertible matrix, right? Um, so with that, I didn't really change the SDP. Somehow it's clear that we are still talking about the same SDP. However, as soon as I did that, as, I, as soon as I did this, a linear transformation, the problem becomes a complete mess and, and there is just no hierarchy uh, anymore, right? So, so this, this nice hierarchy is completely destroyed. So the other question that comes up is that, is it possible to represent the large solutions in polynomial space? And that seems more hopeful because because if I want to convince you that the two to the two to the M minus one is a feasible solution, then I don't have to write down the two to the two to the M minus one because I can just do a symbolic computation. I can just symbolically square the variables and then convince myself that two to the two to the M minus one is indeed feasible. So these are the two uh, major questions. So the first, um, the first uh, idea to answer the first question is that probably this is, this is not true. These are very rare. And the only problem we know is, is Hachian, is Hachian's example. And, and it's easy to destroy the large solutions. So we have to moderate our expectations, what we want to prove. Second, it looks more hopeful. So to, to, um, to move forward, actually, we are going to give a partial yes answer to both of these questions. And the a little, little background is I'm going to define K to be the singularity degree of this dual system, right? So, so there's this primal system in which the large solutions show up, and then I have this dual system. And, um, and so the, if you know what is a singularity degree, that's great. It has to do with facial reduction. If you don't know what it is, that's fine. We can just um, uh, take this as a black box. It's a non-negative integer number, and for linear programs, it's at most one. So as we expect, for linear programs, we will not be able to prove anything. And we are going to assume that the SDP is strictly feasible, so there is an X, so that the, this combination is positive definite, okay? So now here's the, and we, we can already uh, state our um, informal version of theorem one which is that there exists an invertible matrix such that after I do a linear change of variables, which is I replace X with MX, then I get an, another SDP, which I call SDP prime with the following properties. Um, for any X, which is feasible in SDP prime and XK is large enough, then we have this hierarchy among the variables. So, um, a strictly feasible SDP can be transformed into a Hutchian type SDP where the exponents, the alphas, are not too small, but they are bounded away from one, but they are not too large either. So they are at most two, each one of them. And um, 
So dj and alpha g are constants that depend on the constraint matrices and the uh, other axes that we consider fixed. So, so the upshot of this theorem is that every strictly feasible SVP looks like a Hutchian type SVP, right? So we only have to do a linear transformation and we have to assume that this XK is large enough. And, and based, based on that, every strictly feasible SVP looks like a Hutchian SVP. And um, the assumptions that we make here are minimal. So for example, we have to do this linear transformation, otherwise we just we just cannot prove anything. I mean, as I as um, I mentioned, even in the Hutchian SVP, if I do such a transformation, I can completely destroy the structure. So I have to permit doing this linear transformation to to sort of undo the destruction and to recover the Hutchian SVP. So this is probably the most uh, important part of the well talk, so, so I'm going to stop here and see if there is any question. No? Uh, is there any intuition how to get this M or is it just like random? No, no, M, M, is, M is a very specifically uh, constructed M. So, so, so the proof gives you, um, the proof is constructive in the sense that it tells you how to construct the M. Um, it's not true that this, there is a polynomial time algorithm to compute the M because, I mean, we would have to solve SDPs in polynomial time, for example, but the M is very, very specific. Does that answer your question? Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, that answers it. Okay, so essentially every every strictly feasible SDP looks like a Hutchian SDP. So, to, uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, show two examples. So the worst case example is uh, basically the Hutchian SDP. I put together a linear matrix inequality like this, and I'm going to look at the subdeterminant with three red corners. So this 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 and the one in the uh, lower right. So that tells me that x1 is greater than x2 squared. And then I can look at the blue corner determinants and the green corner determinants, and I get, and I get these inequalities, as I would expect. So, so, it's, so of course, it's not too surprising because Hutchian's example already tells us that, that this worst case can happen. So the exponents are the largest possible that can um, happen in our theorem one. So now the, now the best case example, is something that I call the mild SDP. This looks just like the Hutchian example, except the axes were shifted a little, little bit to the to the left. And then I can do the same game. Um, so the red subdeterminant says x1 times x3 greater or equal than x2 squared. The blue subdeterminant says x2, x4 greater or equal than x3 squared. And then we have x3 greater or equal than x4 squared. Okay, so now these look a little bit more complicated, but I can do a uh, little algebra and I can derive these inequalities. So here the exponents of the x's on the uh, right-hand side are minimal, which are permitted in by my uh, by our, our theorem one. So, so both of these uh, cases can actually happen. Yeah, any questions? I'm, I should just stop here for a second. Okay, so uh, we can draw a picture. This is Hutchian's SDP, and this is the mild SDP, and we see that here the growth of the X3 versus, oh, sorry, growth of, growth of X1 versus X3 is pretty drastic. Okay, so now, so then, then actually that was a good question that, you know, what is this M, right? Um, now I want, I'm going to show how this reformulated SDP looks. So I'm going to call that SDP prime. And the reformulated SDP looks like, so the X1 has a coefficient matrix, which is an identity and then lots of zeros. The X2 has a coefficient matrix, which has some arbitrary stuff in the first bunch of rows and columns. And the number of those rows is exactly R1. 
which is the size of the identity in the um, coefficient matrix of the X1. And we keep going like that, right? So, so we have this staircase structure. So this reformulated SDP is actually very specific. And um, um, so the way I got this is first by doing this linear change of variables. And on the other end, and I did one more trick, which um, is just used to make everything uh, neater. I also did a similarity, tra similarity transformation. So I replaced the AIs by T transpose AIT, where T is some invertible matrix. And of course, if I do that, that doesn't really affect the um, feasibility of the axis because that's just a congruence transformation, but it just makes everything look more intuitive and nicer. And the, and the background is that this has to do with facial reduction. So essentially these, these um, staircase structured matrices uh, form a so-called facial reduction sequence. Again, it's, it's not really necessary to know all the uh, intricacies of facial reduction. Um, it's just the important thing is that uh, from this STP prime, we can derive those, that, that hierarchy of the variables. So this is how um, our, our reformulated SDP looks. Okay. Now, from the SDP prime, we can come up with these with these inequalities. Right. So, so the inequalities that I want to uh, derive are xj is greater or equal than constant times xj plus one to the power of some kind of positive constant, which is alpha j plus one. And the alpha j plus one, they can actually be computed by a very neat formula. So the um, there is this number tj plus one, which I'm going to explain in a second. So alpha j plus one is either simply two, or it can be computed based on the alpha j plus two, alpha j plus three, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so we, can, we can compute them backwards. So first I compute the um, alpha k and, um, sorry, alpha k or, uh, no, alpha k plus one, and then alpha k, alpha k minus one. And there's a, there is this neat formula, which looks like actually a, a continued fractions formula. Okay, and then, okay, I have to tell you what is Tj plus one. So the Tj plus one is, I look at that li linear matrix inequality. And the Tj plus one is the index of the rightmost block where Xj plus one shows up. And what this is telling us is that if I shift Xj plus one to the right, then Tj plus one is going to increase and alpha J plus one is going to increase because here in the, in the denominator, I multiply more things. And then if I do the algebra, I see that the alpha J plus one gets bigger. Okay, so let's look at an example. So um, the participant has enabled closed captioning. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I, I guess it shouldn't bother me. So we look at this first matrix inequality. Um, this matrix has to be positive semi-definite, but I left it out because I just want to make uh, the picture simpler. And from this, I uh, derived the alphas, which is four thirds, three over two and two. So alpha two is four thirds, alpha three is three over two, alpha four is two. So let's do a little shifting here. So I'm going to shift the X2 a little bit towards the right. Uh, and then I get this linear matrix inequality and the alpha two jumped up. So as, so as soon as I shifted the X two towards the right, the alpha two became bigger. And, um, and I do it again, and then alpha two became even bigger. So what this is telling us is that in the Hutchian SDP, these axes were pushed all the way to the right. And that gave me big coefficients. And in this mild SDP, which is the first SDP in the in this sequence, they were pushed towards the left, right? So and 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 then the exponents were kind of small. So so there is a reason for that. So there is actually a mathematical reasoning that proves that this has to happen. So in other words, I went from x one greater or equal than x two to the power of four thirds 
all the way to x1 greater or equal than x2 squared. Okay, again, I should, I guess, stop here and see if there is any, sorry, uh, there is any question. Yeah, I, I have a question. So maybe I missed this point here, but can you tell me where do you need the strict feasibility assumption which you made at the first place? Yeah, that's the only one which is actually not obvious. <laughs> I, I, I think you 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 pointed out the only assumption which is not obvious. It's possible to construct SDPs which satisfy, which have large singularity degree, mm -hmm. um, but they are not strictly feasible and they do not, and we cannot derive this result. So there's an example in the paper. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually so that's the only assumption that's that's not trivial. I mean, I mean the linear transformation. That's obvious why we have to do that, and and and, and the x k being large. That's also obvious. This one is not obvious. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now, okay, you could ask that. Okay. So do we really need this change of variables? And in general, yes. I mean, so we discussed that we need, in general we need this. Uh, that sometimes we don't. And there is two really beautiful examples. Um, so there is this family of SDPs, which are called sum of squares SDPs. And there are many of them which are in the form of this SDP prime, which is my special form. Let me actually go back. So that's, that's the SDP in this staircase structure. And I don't have to do anything. They just, they just come naturally like that. So the first one, is that if I want to minimize a univariate polynomial by semi-definite programming, then in the dual SDP, I'm going to have this um, hierarchy among the variables. And from this, I can derive that y2n is greater, than, greater or equal than y2 to the power of n. So the dual variables have this uh, hierarchy, and, um, and the dual SDP is in that is in that special form of the SDP prime. And this is kind of interesting because, I mean, this tells us that, you know, some of squares SDPs are really hard to solve. And then there are other reasons. Of course, there are reasons um, like about the conditioning of the uh, slack matrix. So, so Hunkel matrices, which are positive semi-definite or exponentially ill-conditioned. But this is another reason. I mean, if, this, if the variables have to be so very different, then it's no wonder that we get um, numerical issues. And the other one is a very beautiful example by Ryan O'Donnell. So he, he wrote down a sum of square SDP to certify that this polynomial, which is the sum of the xi's minus 2y1, is non-negative subject to these constraints that the x size are zero or one and the y is equal to zero. Okay. Um, and of course, of course, this is non negative, right? I mean, it is trivial. But if we write a, a sum of squares SDP, then actually what we're going to have is we are going to get Hutchian's SDP. So we are going to get that, that hierarchy of u1 greater than u2 squared, et cetera, et cetera. So, so these two SDPs, they naturally come in, in that form. Of, um, of that SDP prime. Okay, so now I don't know how much time do I have. Like it's four minutes, okay. So I'm going to just quickly uh, review this. So there is this um, question, how can we certify that exponential size solutions exist by using only polynomial space, by using a small amount of space. And this is my reformulated SDP prime. And then now suppose I have xk plus one and so on xm, which are the, the easy variables. They, they, they don't get large. So suppose that I, I have fixed them. And then this first axis, they are the problematic ones. They are the ones that can be large, right? And so basically, I would like to certify that this SDP is feasible, but I don't want to compute the x1 through xk. So what do I do? So we can prove that they exist without actually computing them. And what do I do is I start with this z, which is the combination of the easy variables, and then symbolically add 
um, a multiple of the AK prime, AK minus one prime to make larger and larger lower right corners positive definite. Okay, so the scheme of this is like this. So this is Z. And then I add the multiple of the AK prime, a large multiple. And then I get the bigger positive uh, definite matrix. And then I do it again and I keep making larger and larger uh, submit is this positive definite. So, um, so this 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 works just like in Hutchian. In other words, I never have to compute numerically the xk xk minus one and so on, because because a simple computation uh, suffices to convince me that they exist. And the inspiration for is there is this paper by Lorenzo Muramasa Tsuchiya in which they used such a staircase kind of addition to do something else, which is uh, to certify weak infeasibility of semi-definite programs. So it's a different um, different purpose, but, but uh, this idea actually works in this context as well. So the conclusion is that um, there is this you know, dilemma in SDPs, you know, how do we get exponential size solutions? Now, it turns out that these bad SDPs are actually very common. So every strictly feasible SDP is just a linear transformation away from being a Hutchian type SDP. We can compute the exponents. There is some nice connection to Fourier and Motzkin elimination, which I am not covering here. Um, but it's in a paper, and there's a partial answer to how to represent exponential size solutions in polynomial space. And we have a paper which um, hopefully is going to appear soon, and then I'm going to update it. So um, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Gabor. So we have a few questions. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Okay, so let me let me somehow uh, try to under try to see who is. Uh, let let me try to see the speakers. No, actually, I don't see the speakers. So you have to come back to to your Zoom session, and then you will see the speakers. Okay, some I still don't see my um, my uh, the party. But anyway, anyway, so please ask. I mean, it doesn't matter. Maybe maybe I can ask first. Uh, so can we somehow uh, apply this derivation to uh, to the central path equations? So maybe one of the question I have in mind is uh, a lower bound or an upper bound on the magnitude of central path solutions. The solutions. Which lie on the central path, and you have, uh, you have lower bound for solutions of a semi-definite feasibility problem. Do you do you have any idea how this can be applied to say something about the magnitude of central solutions? But the, the central path is is uh, nonlinear, right? Right. So we have so on the only nonlinearity is coming from the uh, centrality condition. But um, yeah. so the x times s is equal to mu i, right? So right. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I said, so this, this basically shows um, that everything that we didn't even think to be bad is bad. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, so I guess the non-linearity really kind of uh, makes makes life a lot more difficult, there, right? Because um, I mean, what how do you do facial reduction on on non-linear equations? That's uh, I mean, I mean, my first guess is that that it's it's not obvious at all. Um, but for at least for very small values of mu, because like when mu goes to zero, you you have a feasible. I mean, you can describe the optimal set as a feasibility problem. And then we have a small perturbation, which brings you back on the central path. So if I thought if we, if we know something about 
the optimal set, which is at mu equals zero, then we might be able to say something for sufficiently small values of mu. Well, I don't know. My first guess is it's it's not it's not obvious. Uh, I, I don't have any ready answer for this really, because um, I mean, if at at optimality you have. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, the optimal set of a, of an SDB is just an SDP, right? So the face. So, so you you can probably say something about the optimal solutions in the uh, about the the size of the solutions in the optimal face. I see, right. Um, but along the central pad, that's not obvious. But I mean, we can talk about this more. So. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay, any other question for Gabo? Uh, could you just go back to the slide where you get like the formula for the exponents? Sure. Just want to make sure I got that. This um, one? Yeah, so. So in the other example, you had two as the third one, three halves as the second one, and then the last one. You mean um, this one? Yeah. So um, I, I I don't think I saw why it changes like just from the formula. Sorry, so sorry. Uh, 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 what 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 you did, did what you but what did you not see changing? Uh, so you have the two minus one over two times three halves on the previous two minus one it would over. Like, uh, so here here we start with so here we have um, uh, three alphas, alpha two, alpha three, and alpha four. Yeah. Right, so alpha four is equal to two. Yeah. Okay, so then you are wondering how we computed the three over two. Uh, so the three over two is just two minus one over two, right? That's right, yeah, exactly. And then the third one would be two minus one over two times three halves. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's where the four thirds, but where do you get the, wait, so that would give you five thirds. You get five thirds in the second uh, LMI. Um, or, or, so I guess like my question is where does the ri actually appear in the formula for the exponent? Where does the what appear? Sorry. Uh, so you have these ri's as like the sizes of the blocks for each of the like x size. Yeah. So here the r so the ri's do not appear in the formula at all, right? So the um, eyes simply give you a partitioning of the matrix, right? So, so here R1, R2, R3, and R4, they're all just one. Yeah. But, but what, is the, what, is di what is different between the first LMI and the second LMI is that the X2 is more towards the, the right. So, so for example, um, okay, so I'm, which, which block are we talking about? So, uh, this is block one, block two, block three, right? So here X2 shows up in block three. That's, that's the rightmost one where it shows up. Yeah. Here X2 shows up in block four. That's the, that's the one, that's, that's the rightmost one where it shows up, right? Yeah. So, so here I'm going to multiply more uh, things in the, denominator.
Oh, okay. So the four thirds comes from one minus one over three times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? All right. Uh, if there is no other question, let's thank over again. And thank you all for joining our seminar. I hope to see you again in future, uh, probably somewhere else. Thank okay. you and have a good day. Thank you, Ari. Thank you. Bye.